Hello there, and welcome to Tales of Paranormal, episode three. Uh, our, our, all our virtual talks are free, uh, but we do have a donation button for the uh, MS Society, Multiple Sclerosis Society, if you can. So this time we're talking about West London. We've done the City of London, we've done the City of Westminster, we're going for West London. Rather a large area, and um, London is actually the most haunted capital city in the world. And West London is just crammed full of ghosts uh, and spooky things going on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, we've just picked a few. And we're starting out in, well, this is one of yours, isn't it? Very famous haunted pub. The Grenadier. It's a pub which is only just west of the city of Westminster. It's in the borough of Kensington and Chelsea. The Grenadier pub, tucked away. Um, uh, used to be frequented by soldiers. Uh, the story goes that a young officer one evening was caught cheating at a game of cards by his fellow officers and uh, they were very drunk and angry and they decided to flog him on the spot for this crime. The punishment got out of hand and the young officer died in the cellar of the pub. The paranormal happenings at the pub are always at their peak in September um, when the incident is alleged to have happened. And the the um, staff and visitors at the pub reported a, a former landlord's dog repeatedly whining and scratching at the floor in the cellar, as well as a figure that's seen around the building who sometimes appears so solid that he's mistaken for a living person until he disappears. Beer bottle caps fly off and hurtle across the room and beer bottles levitate and then explode. Ghostly cigarette smoke has been seen drifting in the empty pub as well. All this activity is thought to be the actions of a young officer who was killed. The ghost has been nicknamed Cedric by the pub staff and visitors from around the world who bring money to be pinned to the ceiling, hoping that by paying off Cedric's gambling debts, his spirit might be set free. Charming little pub if you can find it uh, when you're in London. Uh, there are a couple of other ghosts within uh, sort of throwing distance of the Grenadier. Uh, so almost right beside it, almost right behind it is the, uh, on Hyde Park corner, is now the Lanesborough Hotel, but it used to be St George's Hospital. It's the Lanesborough Hotel now, it's home to one of the most expensive hotel suites in London. Uh, the penthouse suite is uh, around £26,000 a night, minimum stay three nights, breakfast not included. Um, but it was a hospital until the 1970s, there is uh, an old image of it when it was a hospital. And like many hospitals it's haunted by the ghost of a former nurse. Now this is said to be a Victorian nurse who died in an accidental fall on a staircase in the hospital. Uh, and she her, her footsteps are heard by everyone, but she only appears to those who are very ill, those who were very ill when it was a hospital. Uh, she would appear, and unlike many of these uh, ghostly nurses in hospitals, she wasn't a harbinger of death. She would often just want to give comfort to people. So um, she, people would often report, oh, that nurse was, was very nice and told me I would be okay. And everyone else, all the living nurses would say, well, what nurse? Um, and then that patient would recover. Uh, she's even said to have fixed um, cannulas, I think, the things in your arm. Uh, uh, a nurse has gone away to get tape and come back and it's all been fixed. So she's a very help she was a very helpful nurse when it was a hospital. It's now a hotel, but the staff have said they still see and hear her uh, on the third and fourth floors of the hotel. Uh, right next to Hyde Park Corner is Hyde Park where there used to be a tree, uh, an elm tree, called Black Sally's tree, or it was later called Black Sally's tree. It was said to have a curse and the rough sleepers in the park would never sleep under that tree, even though it had a really good place to sleep, it was really good. 
um, but they would never sleep under it because it had a curse. Um, one woman decided to ignore that superstition, slept under it and was found dead the following morning. Her name was Sally. So it became known as Black Sally's Tree. Uh, and people who went near it would hear strange groaning and moaning and a woman's voice saying, oh God, oh God. Uh, sadly, or perhaps fortunately, Black Sally's tree uh, was lost to Dutch elm disease in the 20th century. So it no longer stands and the curse seems to have gone uh, with the tree. In another part of Hyde Park uh, is the Pet Cemetery, the Hyde Park Pet Cemetery. Uh, it was started in, 1880, in the 1880s uh, when a dog named Cherry was buried near a lodge there. Uh, the, the, the lady liked to walk her dog there. She was friends with the, the chap who, um, who was the gardener at the lodge. And suddenly all these little headstones uh, started popping up. There have been some reports of ghosts of animals seen in the cemetery, but really not all that many. Um, so it seems that the residents of the pet cemetery in Hyde Park have managed to achieve their eternal rest. Uh, which is good. But there is another animal ghost in another cemetery in London. Um, so we're going to the Brompton Cemetery. Uh, the Brompton Cemetery there, uh, uh, not far from Chelsea Football Club. Uh, it's beautiful from the air. It's got these lovely uh, uh, sort of geometric uh, pathways. It's where uh, Henry Cole, who invented the Christmas card, was buried. Emmeline Pankhurst is buried there. William Terrace. Uh, his ghost is actually said to appear here as well as several other places in London, which we spoke about in our Westminster tour. Um, it was built in the 1800s as one of the Magnificent Seven cemeteries around the outside of London to ease the pressure in the crowded centres, uh, centre of the of London and Westminster. Uh, the Brompton Cemetery is it's a, it's a lovely thing. And there's the ghost of a squirrel that's been seen in Brompton Cemetery. Uh, now, how do we know that it's not just a squirrel, a living squirrel. Um, the fact that it's vaguely transparent is a bit of a clue uh, and the fact that it's a red squirrel. People have said they've seen a red squirrel in Brompton Cemetery. Now red squirrels are critically endangered uh, in England and certainly haven't been seen in London since the 1920s uh, and I'm not sure what excite whether it excites me more to think there's the ghost of a squirrel in Brompton Cemetery or whether there might be a, a surviving red squirrel in Brompton Cemetery, how exciting would that be? Uh, on the on the note of squirrels, and this isn't really a spooky thing, uh, there's a, a, a Susanna Nutkins buried in Brompton Cemetery. Beatrix Potter used to live very nearby and it's thought that that headstone is the inspiration behind Squirrel Nutkins uh, in the Beatrix Potter books. There's also a grave to a Peter Rabbit uh, as well, which is uh, perhaps where she got the inspiration for that as well. Um, you've got there, is, story. there is an impressive mausoleum in Brompton Cemetery, which belongs to Hannah Courtois, who died in 1849. She had inherited the fortune of merchant John Courtois, the father of their children, although they never actually married. That she used her inheritance to fund a busy social life and an interest in Egyptology. The tomb is in an ancient Egyptian style and covered in hieroglyphs and Egyptian symbolism. Egyptologist Joseph Bonomi was a close friend and it's thought he helped her to design the tomb and he's also buried nearby. Many have suggested that the two of them had learned the ancient Egyptian uh, secret to time travel and had also built Courtois tomb as a time machine. In 2011, it was claimed that the tomb wasn't a time machine, but was a teleportation device designed by Samuel Warner, who was also buried nearby. <laughs> this theory is that the device links with similar tombs in the other magnificent seven cemeteries and a cemetery in Paris. This is the tomb in Kensal Green Cemetery, this one. Uh, Courtois tomb is apparently the only mausoleum in the cemetery with no surviving plans. The key has been lost and the lock is so complex 
that a locksmith was unable to open it, so we may never know what, if any, device is hidden inside. Quite fascinating that. Mm. Um, the conspiracy theorists, actually, when I was researching this, they, they say that it's suspicious that the cemetery has never had a key made um, to be able to see if there's a time machine or a top transportation device in it. Uh, Brompton Cemetery, on the other hand, which is run by Royal Parks, say it's simply too expensive to have a key made. It's a very, very specific block. It's too expensive and they are reluctant to disturb those resting within. Um, just on a whim to find out if this is really a working TARDIS. So we may never know, Brompton Cemetery seem to not be in a hurry to open it. So now we're going uh, not far away from Brompton Cemetery, we're going to the museum area of South Kensington, where the museums are. It's nicknamed Albertopolis. Um, it, it was after the Great Exhibition of 1851, Prince Albert used some of the profits to establish these museums. Uh, in South Kensington, uh, insisting that they were free uh, to visit. And they're still there today. Uh, uh, the Science Museum there, I can personally attest that museums, or at least this one, they're very creepy places when they're empty. Or I found them creepy anyway. I used to work briefly at the Science Museum at one of the exhibitions, a temporary exhibition there. Uh, and it, it was very, very creepy. I used to have to walk through the space gallery here um, on my way out in the evenings. And it was just really creepy, really. I, 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 once I was, I would swear that I heard something whispering right behind my head. Um, I have to say that it is very dark, the space gallery, particularly when everyone's gone, it's deserted and they've turned the lights off, the main lights off, um, the, the exhibit lights off rather. And there are really big rocket shapes looming in the dark. So that could be imagination. But the security guards did once tell me that they often hear very strange sounds in the flight gallery, which is just behind the space gallery. Well, as, as I was walking out anyway, it was just behind the space gallery. Um, the, the, they said they could hear like noises if the planes, the, the engine noises were going, faint engine noises. Having said that, this is the same security guards who laughed at me when I ran through the space gallery when I thought I heard someone whispering behind me. So their credibility is a little in depth. Uh, not far away from the Science Museum is the Natural History Museum. Gorgeous building, delightful museum uh, if you are ever in London. Um, the Natural History Museum has uh, a few sort of weird incidents like lights turning on and off and doors unlocking and locking, things like that. Uh, and there's also the ghost of a woman who's seen in the dark corners of the gallery. And the Natural History Museum holds the remains of about 200,000 human beings throughout human history um, and it's thought that this woman, uh, this very indistinct woman uh, is, is, is one of them. One of the deserted galleries there in the taxidermy bit which taxidermy freaks me out anyway for some reason. Much richer paranormal pickings are to be had at the Victorian Albert Museum where it seems that almost every exhibit has some sort of ghost story or curse attached to it including the ghost of a former warder in the basement, a haunted dress that has been seen to breathe, <laughs> uh, a haunted candlestick, and so many more that we don't have time to cover them all. The most well-known ghost story of the V&A is about the Great Bed of Ware. The ornate four-poster bed was made in 1463 as a gift for King Edward IV by carpenter Jonas Fosbrook. It's large enough to hold 12 people and was mentioned by Shakespeare. When it left the royal family, it ended up at the inn in Ware, Hertfordshire, where people carved rude graffiti on it. The ghost of the carpenter who made it attacks any commoners who sleep in it, allegedly. Apparently, to appease Fosbrook's ghost, you must drink a toast to him before turning the lights out. Bit of Dutch courage as well, eh? Yes. Um, the, the ghost story that I quite liked when I was uh, sort of looking into this was this. This is a, a fairly nondescript wing burgery chair, I think you call that, green chair. It was owned by uh, Ava Marie Vagel, who was David Garrick's wife. 
Uh, and you can see it's got this really firm cushion on the seat, but several times a day sometimes the seat deflates as if someone has sat on it. Uh, and very mysterious, nobody can really explain why, and then it reinflates again as if someone's got up. And it's thought to be the ghost of uh, Ava Marie still enjoying her comfortable chair. Um, up at the top there we've got the Royal Albert Hall. Um, the Royal Albert Hall, which is not strictly speaking a museum, um, but I, crammed with ghosts and it's, it's, it's a stone's throw from the museum, so I'm chucking it in anyway. There it is. Um, so the Royal Albert Hall has several ghosts actually, more than we can fit in here. Um, there's a, a, a two female ghosts that the security staff have nicknamed the girls. Um, they're seen in the cellars and in the backstage areas, and they're seen running through this foyer area and into the canteen, where they're heard giggling and moving things around in the kitchen, but then no one's in there when they open the door. Um, there's one woman saw the ghost of a horse, uh, a chap in military uniform riding a horse um, through the Royal Albert Hall, um, and, but nobody else could see it when she asked people, hey, what's that horse doing there? What horse? Nobody else has seen the horse though, so I, I think maybe that, that ghost might have been attached, maybe that ghost was attached to a visitor rather than to the hall. I think that does work sometimes, that ghosts kind of travel with people. Um, it, the organ here, if that's ever being worked on, if they're ever doing renovation or rebuilding or whatever, uh, on it, the ghost of a, 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 a very dark ghost of a man with a dark skull cap appears, which is thought to be Henry Willis, uh, who made the first organ known as Father Willis. Uh, who appears any time there's work going on. I wonder how he felt about screens being erected on his uh, lovely organ. Um, uh, and there's another great story, which is this one of yours. A isn't it? disorientated man wearing white has been seen by several people to cross the stage during a performance by the comedian Jasper Carrot in the 1990s. Uh, while those who saw him were convinced they'd seen him, including a stage manager who put out a bad-tempered radio call to demand to know why someone was on the stage. <laughs> Those who didn't see him were equally adamant that there was nobody but Jasper Carrot on stage. Yeah. The, tube strain, the tube train that is closest to the museums is South Kensington. The train station is home to the ghost of a steam train which was first seen in 1928. This was long after the lines had electric trains on them. A passenger was getting off the last train and was the last one on the platform when he heard another train and saw a ghostly steam train with a guard in a peaked hat and a coat clinging to the side of the train as it came into the platform. The train then disappeared into a covered tunnel that has never had any track in it. The ghostly train has been seen several times since then. The last recorded sighting was in 2013. Mm. West London does weirdly have a few ghosts of kind of public transport. So we've got the ghost of a tube train uh, in South Kensington. Uh, down here on Bayswater Road, uh, people see the ghost of a horse and carriage, which makes no noise. It just silently moves down Bayswater Road. Uh, up near Notting Hill on Cambridge Road at a corner, um, people see the ghost of a bus in London General Omnibus uh, livery. This kind of, so this kind of old motor bus uh, is seen. It was first seen um, by several motorists who'd all swerved to avoid it. Um, and when they were interviewed by the police, they described the bus and all the policemen said, well, that's impossible. They don't use that livery anymore. The, the design that the bus had on it had gone out of use a, a year or two before. Uh, and the, this phantom bus has been seen since those drivers told that policeman that story, maybe to get out of the fact that they'd swerved dangerously, maybe because they had seen this ghost bus. Uh, and in Kensington, there's a, a, a very weird story about a... Uh, ghostly taxi that took a woman. So the, 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 a vicar was in his church and this woman shows up and, and begs him to come with her. Come with me, come with me. I, I've got a taxi waiting. You've got to come with me. So she ushers, she ushers the vicar into this taxi, which seems perfectly real. Everything seems perfectly real. 
and they go off to a house and, and the woman explains in the taxi that there's a man in the house who's 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 dying and he's 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 concerned about his soul the state of his soul so the chap gets to the door knocks on the door uh, the butler comes to the door there's nobody dying here what you're talking about uh, and the vicar very confused turns around to the lady and the taxi which he hasn't heard leave so he's assuming is still there and they both just disappeared completely and the following day uh, he's called back to the same house because the master of the house died unexpectedly and as the vicar goes in uh, to do what he needs to do uh, he walks past the portrait of the woman who'd come to him the day before and he asked who she was and it was the man's wife and she died years earlier and um, so this was in the area of Kensington, that this uh, ghostly taxi. Uh, and Kensington is quite a wealthy area, so it's not uh, a, a huge surprise that, that the uh, ghostly residents of Kensington can afford to have ghostly taxis as well. Uh, and the area of Kensington became very popular with the rich and wealthy uh, when King William III and Queen Mary II moved into Kensington Palace um, because they rather liked it and suddenly it was the place to go. Now West London has a few royal palaces and lots of manor houses and we kind of picked them for our last few ghosts because uh, they look pretty in pictures basically. Um, so starting out with Kensington Palace, there it is. This uh, goes back to um, the 17th century. King George II anyway was staying at the palace when he died in 1760. At the time, the, there was Europe-wide conflict with the Seven Years' War, which was raging. His last words were said to be, why won't they come? Referring to the messengers bringing news of the army on the front line. In the palace today, a disembodied voice is heard to repeat those words, why won't they come? It's said that his spirit has been seen at a window <laughs> uttering those very words. Peter the Wild Boy was a feral child found by George II's father, George, King George I, in the woods of Hamelin. And uh, he came to live with him in the palace. Peter was depicted on a mural in the main staircase. Peter remained unable to learn a language and had a distinctive appearance, probably due to a disorder called Pitt Hopkins. He lived in a heart for children for most of his life and lived until he was around 70 years old. So it's uncertain why the ghost of Peter as a boy is seen on the staircase of the palace. Hmm. Weird. Uh, Kensington Palace does have a few other ghosts, but we're only picking a couple in each palace. Uh, going out to Kew Palace. Uh, Kew Palace, which is gorgeous. Uh, Kew Palace was built, <coughs> excuse me, in the early 1600s by a merchant uh, and taken over by uh, King George II for his uh, daughters in the 1700s. Uh, this is Queen Charlotte. She was the wife of King George III. She loved Kew Palace uh, and she had her own little cottage built in the grounds uh, there. Uh, she, her ghost is seen in, in that cottage in the chair that she died in. But in the palace itself is one of George III's children, Prince Octavius. It's a rather sad story. Prince Octavius died when he was only four years old. Um, sadly, this was when George III was suffering from the mental illness that ended up killing him. Um, and he, he would frequently carry a pillow around and calling it Prince Octavius. He never really came to terms with the boy's death. And staff today see the ghost of a, a very small figure in white, holding a little candle, which they believe to be Prince Octavius. Uh, rather a sad story. So it's a beautiful palace, Kew Palace, but it does have that tinge of sadness because the, the, there are a few stories with George III that are, that are a little sad. So Kew, is in the, uh, Kew Palace is in the grounds of Kew Gardens, the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew, which are also staggeringly beautiful if you uh, ever get the chance to go. Uh, Kew Gardens, uh, there are a couple of ghosts in palm houses of former gardeners, but one of the weirdest incidents was in 2003 when the staff came to work one morning and found a crop circle uh, in a wheat field that's near the river in Kew Gardens. Uh, the security staff who'd been working that night swore nobody had broken in, nobody had got in to the gardens and to leave that crop circle. 
Uh, many crop circles, of course, have been left as hoaxes or, or um, pranks, uh, but it's never been discovered who, whether it was a UFO or a hoaxer, who left that crop circle uh, at Kew. Um, London is a bit of a hot spot for UFOs. In the records of the Ministry of Defence UFO Investigation Department, there are 54 reports in London, more than any other town or city in the UK, including a UFO that was described as looking like a blue banana with arms and legs, spotted in West London in 1989. In 1992, the air traffic controllers at Heathrow Airport saw a black boomerang-shaped UFO which was stationary over the airport before flying off towards the east. Black boomerang UFOs have been spotted quite, um, by quite a few uh, uh, people and air traffic controllers over the years, actually. In 1984, several people watched a UFO over the Thames from Waterloo Bridge in central London. Holland. Yes. Oh, um, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes, UFOs. Uh, London does seem to be a UFO place. A lot of them d are described as boomerangs or with flashing different coloured lights on in London. That seems to be the thing. Uh, I don't have any actual footage or photos of any of the UFOs seen over London, but there's loads on YouTube. Uh, if you're The trouble with recent ones is it's often you could easily believe it's a drone. Uh, the yeah. sort of pre-drone era UFOs are a bit more interesting. So we're going to Holland House uh, next. Holland House, uh, it, well actually very little of it survives, um, it's now the grounds of it are open as Holland Park which is gloriously beautiful. If you are ever in London uh, it's, it, it's got beautiful Japanese gardens and formal gardens and resident pigs and peacocks and things, lovely. Um, little of Holland House survives, uh, and it was never really a, a royal residence, but it was used by Oliver Cromwell as an army barracks during the English Civil War and uh, during the, when we were briefly without monarchs during the Republic. So there's Holland House in its day. Um, Holland House was, well, one of the occupants was called Henry Rich. Um, Henry Rich was beheaded in 1649 and he, his ghost is said to, his headless ghost is said, was said to walk through Holland House, coming out of the wall where a secret doorway used to be, uh, and just beside where that doorway was were three spots of blood that could never be cleaned. It was also said John Aubrey, the 17th century historian, um, said that female residents of the house would see their own doppelganger just before they died. Uh, now, sadly, Holland House was destroyed during World War II. Um, the, the, so presumably the spots of blood have now been erased completely and the harbinger of death is no longer around. Um, but the ghost of Henry Rich, there he is, he's still seen uh, in Holland Park and most often in the remains of Holland House, which used to be a, a youth hostel. I don't think they are anymore though. Um, so you can still see the headless ghost of Henry Rich at Holland House. Uh, just near Kew Gardens is Scion House. Scion House was built in the 1500s and is the home of the Duke of Northumberland. It's the London home of the Duke of Northumberland. It's open occasionally on open days. The ghost of a woman in a 1940s outfit is seen in the grounds. She's thought to be a local woman who was murdered in World War II by an American serviceman who returned to America without being identified. The ghost of Lady Jane Grey is also seen in the grounds of Scion House. She was living there when she was told she would be queen in, 18, in 1553. The teenager was only queen for nine days before being usurped and executed by Queen Mary I. Her ghost was last seen in the grounds in 2019. Fulham Palace was the home of the Bishops of London from the 8th century until the 1970s. Uh, the oldest parts of the current building date back to the 1490s. Fulham Palace was the unfortunate site of the mistreatment and torture of Protestant prisoners 
by Bishop Edmund Bonner. The ghost of Bonner haunts the palace, most recently encountered in 2019 as a glowing orb rushing at the site manager, which disappeared as soon as he turned on the overhead light. It's uncertain whether all the ghostly goings on are caused by Bishop Bonner or his victims, but other spooky incidents at Fulham Palace indicate include music played in the locked and deserted chapel and dark figures who abruptly disappear. One figure even indignantly told the security guard, I live here before disappearing before his very eyes. The sounds of footsteps have been heard and the smell of tobacco smoke when there are no smokers on the premises. Mm. Um, off to Ham House near Richmond Park. Uh, ha Ham, Ham House is, uh, was the home of Elizabeth Murray. Um, Elizabeth Murray, who uh, wasn't royal, but played a rather dangerous and invented game, in the early 1600s, she was friends with both Oliver Cromwell and King Charles I during the English Civil War. Managed to get away with it as well. Rather a formidable woman, apparently. There's Elizabeth Murray. Uh, and there's a mirror. Uh, the mirror is in one of the ground floor buildings of Ham House. Uh, and apparently visitors who go in are inexplicably afraid to look at it. They don't know why they're frightened to look at it but they are, people won't look in it, uh, many people. The ground floor, the ground floor room is, uh, has an, uh, an atmosphere that's so oppressive that even the staff working there, before they go in, will kind of mutter under their breath, good afternoon, your ladyship, um, uh, or, or good evening, your ladyship, or whatever time of day it is, and to kind of appease the ghost of the Duchess. She's the most active ghost there, uh, although one of the ghosts of her King Charles Spaniels uh, also haunts Ham House as well. Uh, Chiswick House near the uh, in Hammersmith. Chiswick House was built. There it is. Uh, built for Richard Boyle in the uh, Earl of Burlington in the early 1700s. Uh, it's it's strangely in one portion of the palace, people smell frying bacon uh, if they're walking through it. Uh, this is a part of the building where there were kitchens. But no longer are so the kitchens are now nowhere near this build this part of the building but people still still smell this frying bacon smell and the smell can linger for months and then go away and then come back again months later and um, so it's haunted by the ghost of bacon which is a little bit strange uh, the ghost of lady burlington has also been seen in a mirror sort of behind somebody um but yeah the area known as chiswick has a few other ghosts outside the manor uh, including the ghost of a murdered woman in the police station, and the ghost of a horse in the cellar of the old pack horse pub. There's a poltergeist that was active in 1656 on, oh, 1956, excuse me, on Esmond Road. Coins and small metal items flew around and hit people the activity stopped when the teenage son of the family was sent away to live with relatives. It is commonly thought that poltergeist activity is either attracted to or caused by the presence of teenagers, as if puberty wasn't stressful enough. The Tudor splendour of Hampton Court Palace is one of London's most famous haunted palaces, so much so that fake ghost postcards used to be sold in the gift shop in the early 20th century. It's said that two of Henry VIII's wives still walk the palace. Uh, Jane Seymour, Henry VIII's third wife, died from complications after the birth of her son Edward in 1537. And her ghost is seen as a pale figure on a staircase which leads up to the room where she gave birth and she only appears on the date of her son's birth rather than the date of her own death which was a few days later. Henry VIII's fifth wife Catherine Howard was executed for adultery 
at the age of 19 in 1542. When she was arrested at Hampton Court, it said that she ran terrified through a gallery to try and plead with the king who was in the chapel. The ghost is still seen reliving this terror-stricken dash. The sound of a spinning wheel used, oh sorry, used to be heard in the, one of the Grace and Favour apartments. The spinning wheel responsible for the noise could not be found until a wall was removed during renovation and an old much used wheel was found. It's thought it belonged to a former royal nurse, Sybil Penn. In the 19th century, the resident of a different Grace and Favour apartment complained of knocking on her walls. Nobody believed her and no cause of the noise could be found. In the 1870s, during work to one of the cloisters next to her apartment, two male skeletons were found. The men were buried during the 17th century and it's likely they were victims of some sort of misdoing during the English Civil War. Their identities are unknown, but residents of the apartment said the noises ceased as soon as the bodies were found. Most famously, the CCTV cameras caught a spectral figure at the Hampton Court Palace. In 2003, a fire door mysteriously opened with some force every day for three days in a row. On the second day, the cameras saw a dark robed figure with a pale face reach out and close the doors. The palace were adamant that none of their costume guides were present at the time and also added that none of their staff wear costumes that matched the description. Yeah. I do think it's interesting how kind of ghost reporting and, and ghost hunting has changed um, in that you do hear about ghosts on CCTV. The, the Hampton Court one is probably the most famous. Um, but the National Gallery have caught a ghost on their CCTV. Um, there's a um, there's actually a ghost in Paddington, which is up here somewhere. Um, in Paddington, there's a storage facility uh, that used to be a children's hospital, and the security staff there say that they see the ghosts of children running up and down the corridors on CCTV. Um, and when I was researching this, and I wish I'd found it sooner actually, because I could have done a bit more searching on it. Um, but I found that people report ghosts via Twitter and they appear on TripAdvisor. Uh, I found this little Twitter uh, exchange with somebody reporting a ghost that they'd seen at the Royal Albert Hall during a Gary Barlow uh, gig. Um, and the Royal Albert Hall seemed dreadfully interested about it. These places do tend to be, by the way, if you're in London and something weird happens to you, report it in some way. Apparently Twitter is the way to do it these days. The ghosts also appear on TripAdvisor. I was looking for haunted hotels uh, in Kensington to see if there were any famous haunted hotels. Uh, and I found that someone had put a TripAdvisor review about a haunted hotel um, and, and have knocked a star off for the ghosts. Well, I wouldn't go back if it was haunted either, I don't think. Um, so, yeah, I wish I'd discovered that people mentioned ghosts on TripAdvisor earlier because I could, I could have uh, searched for loads of places, uh, ghosts on TripAdvisor. Um, so yeah, put it on TripAdvisor as well, but, but don't, don't knock a star off, it's, it's not their fault they're haunted, is it? Um, so yes, thank you very much uh, for joining us for Tales of Paranormal London, episode three. Uh, if you can, please do donate to the Multiple Sclerosis Society uh, at our fundraiser, our Just Giving webpage or directly to the MS Society. Uh, our, our, our virtual tip jar is down there, but obviously we'd much prefer donations to the MS Society. Uh, next time we're doing our fourth episode of Creatures of London in North London. Thank you very much. Thank you.